Thank you very much for joining us today. We'll be talking with Tom Miller about his new novel, The Philosopher's Flight. I actually went to high school with Tom. We're both proud graduates of Wauwatosa West High School in Wauwatosa, Wisconsin. And from there, Tom went on to study at Harvard, Notre Dame, and the University of Pittsburgh. And he's an ER doctor in Madison. Um, and I'll actually let Tom tell you a little bit more about himself and about his new book. Yes, so I'm a second year resident right now and uh, took time off for medicine to write full time and uh, wrote, wrote the book we're going to talk about and, and read a little bit from today. Uh, during that time and, and sort of really worked on revising it during that time. It had been a project I started uh, I think in earnest around the end of 2009 or, or, or 2000, early 2010. So I'd been kicking around some of the ideas for going back probably uh, almost uh, almost 10 or 15 years now. Um, what do you need to know? Let's see, should, we, should I describe the book or yeah. describe the world a little bit? Yeah, give it's, us a synopsis. It's the trouble with fantasy novels, much less historical fantasy novels, but you really only need to know three things uh, about the philosopher's flight. Thing number one is that this is uh, set in America in 1917 in a world in which magic though nobody calls it magic. It's empirical philosophy, and it's definitely not magic. But <laughs> magic was discovered about 200 years earlier and caused the world to evolve in a different way as a result. Thing number two you should know is women are a lot better at philosophy, or sigilry, as it's also known, than men. And that has caused a lot of uh, suspicion and hostility over the years. And thing number three is that the protagonist, uh, is, uh, whose name is Robert Weeks, is one of the rare men who is good at empirical philosophy, uh, which makes him a little bit unusual. Great. Uh, would you mind reading to us a Yeah, a so from your I can read, I'm going to read a little bit from the middle, which is sort of doubly a dangerous thing to do. <laughs> So to catch you up on what's happened, Robert has, he has grown up his whole life raised by his mother and his three sisters. All of them are really uh, very gifted, very powerful philosophers and sort of brought him up to do it as well. Um, he ends up earning a scholarship to Radcliffe College, which if you want to study uh, philosophy, obviously you go to a women's school to do that. So Robert is one of three men at Radcliffe in 1917. And that meets with all sorts of uh, all sorts of skepticism or or, or cattiness or, or outright uh, outright hostility and violence at times. Uh, he has dreamed his whole life of following in his mother's footsteps. His mother was part of the United States Sigilry Corps, which is sort of the uh, the military version uh, of uh, of empirical philosophy, and she was what's termed a rescue and evacuation helicopter. So uh, rescue, and evasion, rescue and evacuation flyer. So if, like me, you grew up watching episodes of MASH where the helicopters fly in uh, with the wounded at the beginning, uh, that is sort of what they do, though they uh, wear, uh, w uh, I, I should show you the pictures of this. So flyers, um, and, and this requires me to, to back up and probably explain a little bit more about how philosophy works. But Robert, when he flies, wears a, wears a harness. Uh, and part of the reason he wears a harness is to keep uh, his powder bag attached to his body so he doesn't lose it or drop it. The way philosophy works is that you draw figures called sigils with uh, particular, particular kinds of powder. So for different effects, you draw different types of pictures, different sigils or symbols. And those produce different effects. Uh, to fly, he has a mix of uh, corn powder, so very finely ground cornmeal, as well as sand and some other chemicals, and a large 8 or 12 pound bag with a regulator at the end with a fine tip on it so he can control how fast the powder trickles through. Every 8 seconds or so, he draws a different symbol, and that uh, continues to provide power so that, he can, uh, so that he can fly. I think that's really about all that you need to know. So Robert streamed his whole life of following in his mother's footsteps and joining in rescue and evacuation. And of course, that's, that's impossible because uh, he's a man and, and no man has ever done that before. So this is from, uh, from chapter 21 for those of you following along at home. The following week brought with it further miracles and wonders. Brock, 
Oh dear. So Professor Brock is uh, the, uh, the, one of the uh, professors of practical or empirical philosophy, uh, and she teaches flying. Professor Brock reopened the aerodrome and unveiled our new hovering instructors, 10 core veterans who'd been pensioned off due to age. All the, Radcliffe, all the Radcliffe women who were still interested in flying assembled on the landing field to be divided up among the old crones. One after the next, the instructors stepped forward to call out the names of their trainees and lead them into the aerodrome. But my name wasn't on any of the lists. I would have thought I was being singled out again, but Essie was left unassigned too. We stood alone on the field, looking for some indication of what we were supposed to do. Bookkeeping error, I suggested. Essie chewed at her lip. An ancient lady, leaning heavily on a cane, hobbled out of the aerodrome. She wore thick spectacles and had a pair of field glasses on a leather strap around her neck. She hadn't been introduced with the other instructors. She stopped in front of us and straightened painfully. Well, this is a sorry state of affairs, she drawled. Out of this entire aerodrome, only two hoverers have dared mule the phrase rescue and evacuation in connection with their own names. One has fewer flight hours than any of my great-grandchildren, and the other has a phallus. Essie blushed to hear such coarse language. The old lady pointed at her. You're Sarah Stewart? Oh, ma'am, I go by Essie if that's a weak name, a child's name. Stop using it. Now, get kitted out and scout me three different landing approaches to Harvard Square. Uh, ma'am, we're not allowed to uh, hover between. The Cambridge Police Department has no way to catch you. I want you to land and then record on paper three approaches with compass headings and lists of potential obstructions for each. Give it to me in one hour. Get a bag and get up. If Essie was torn about committing a technically illegal act, she overcame her doubts quickly. She trotted toward the aerodrome. Run, the woman bellowed. Essie accelerated to a sprint. And you, the old lady said. Let me see if I have this right. Conducted a solo search and rescue mission over rough country in Montana and lifted out three souls. Dove into the river here to save a drowning hoverer. Ran a mass casualty evacuation on zero minutes notice and flew a goddamn 40 foot stringer. I would say that just about makes you the best male flyer in the world, doesn't it? No, ma'am, I said. Oh, Mother Mary, but he doesn't understand. Child, I was in the Corps 55 years. That's before modern hovering was invented, to save you the math. Back in 11, they said to me, Gertrude, you're too old to fly. So I instructed at Fort McConnell. Then this year, they said, Gertrude, you're too mean to teach. We've got a war on, and we don't want every third girl quitting. So they retired me. And Janet Brock, with all her gold medals and monographs and professor of such and such, said she had a man worth training, a man for the Corps, for R&E. What better revenge for invaliding me out than to dump on them a man who's too good to refuse? So, do you think a woman of my prodigious experience would waste her golden years on anything less than the finest male flyer on earth? Uh, no, ma'am, I said. Good. I want you to believe it. I want you to train like it. And if you choose not to boast about it, then that's your business. As if I would dare have said such a thing in the aerodrome. Show me your hands, Gertrude said. I extended my hands for her. I had dirt under my nails and calluses all rough and yellowed, but she wasn't checking for cleanliness. She produced a tape measure from the work bag at her hip and measured my thumb and index finger, then across my palm in several different dimensions. You have lovely, long, girlish fingers, she said, nodding her approval. Do you know how to fly a lever regulator? I grew up with them, I answered. Then no more of the dial regulator trash they favor here. You'll fly a Chesapeake Mark 20 lever regulator with a two-inch conical tip, three-twist burr board to 80 mil. Uh, I don't think we have. Janet found a used one. She ground the tips herself. Now kneel, or I won't be able to reach. I knelt, and she made further measurements across my neck, chest, hips, thighs, belly, and shoulders recording each with the stub of a pencil in a little book. Beg your pardon, she muttered. She put the field glasses to her eyes in time to see Essie dash, dash out of the aerodrome in full harness. Run, 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 the woman bellowed. Essie flung herself into the air. The old lady checked her wrist chronometer. Six minutes and 40 seconds to kit out and then a three-step launch. Christ, in a fish barrel. And she flies pretty. God damn it. She turned back to me. Brown or black? She asked, excuse me? You're riding a Springfield harness with a lot of homemade improvements? Yes, I said. Not anymore. We're bringing you into the 20th century. Janet should have had you in custom tackle from the day you came in. Well, I can't afford it. You're not paying for it. 
Brown leather or black? Brown. She noted that too and put her book away. Now, what do you weigh first thing in the morning after you void it? She didn't mean anything untoward by it, and I didn't take it that way. I'm not sure, I said. I don't have a. Then buy a scale later today. Give me an estimate. 211. She winced. You stand 72 and a half inches tall. I don't want to fly you above 186 pounds. Are you going to faint on me at that weight? Probably not, I said. Then you're on a diet starting this morning, unless you care to dabble in transporting to improve your figure. I don't judge. Powder flow for your current weight will be 8.9 ounces per minute. I was aghast at the powder expenditure, not her comments regarding weight loss, which was simple physics. A little more cornmeal than you used back home, she asked. Four times more, I said. I would be burning through powder like mad. Well, you're not paying for that either. Then she laid herself down on the ground. Prove you're worth the effort. I'll play the role of your casualty. As fast as you can, I want you to run into that building, kit out, and grab whatever style of harness you intend to fly me in. Then launch, take me two miles out to sea, turn, and land back here. And oh, shoot, you happen to be out of silver chloride this morning. So fly me awake. Clear? Perfectly. Then run, she bellowed. I grabbed my harness and sprinted for the aerodrome. And if you can't do this in half the time it took that little daddy's girl, I'm sending you straight back to the farm. I sprinted harder. There was a line of women snaking out the door, waiting to draw powder and equipment. One of the other old sigil women watched my approach. Clear the way for a hot evac, she yelled. The girl stepped aside to let me through. Professor Brock was behind the counter. A 12-pound general purpose bag, I pounded. Chesapeake 20-ounce regulator with a two-inch. Fine, fine, Brock said, and handed over the items that she'd had waiting right beside her. I'd already slipped into my harness and was cinching down the leg straps. I hope you're enjoying yourself, Professor Brock said. I had to message every, and a 20-foot loop of one-inch cotton webbing. Brock looked flummoxed. Oh, come on, I said. I attached my bag to my hip as Brock pulled out the aerodrome's catalog to see, see where we stocked such a piece of rigging. The old lady at the door laughed. She took a cloth bag from her belt and tossed it underhand to me. Gertrude, 74 years old, the only slightly younger woman said, be gentle. Yes, ma'am, I answered and ran back out. I shook the webbing out of its bag. It was nothing more than a single long strap with the end sewn together, but it made the world's quickest harness. I skidded to a stop next to Gertrude, who was lying flat on her back, and laid the webbing out in a circle around her. At this point, I have to, I have to stop and tell you about a job I used to have. I was an EMT basic for a number of years. Uh, and the only thing I remember how to do from my vehicle rescue course, in which we learned to use the jaws of life and fun stuff like that, uh, is, is a harness that you can use for like lowering, lowering somebody out of a window or, uh, uh, or dragging somebody across the ground. I've never actually had to do it on a living human, but it's actually very easy. All you do is pull the rope up between the legs and then reach under the armpits, pull up, and you have a harness sort of like you're playing cat's cradle. I skidded to a stop next to Gertrude, who was lying flat on her back, and laid out the webbing in a circle around her. Oh, for the love of St. Jude, are you serious? A web harness? You said as fast as I could, I gasped. So do it. I yanked a loop of webbing up beneath her feet and up between her legs, then reached through it to pull up the strap from under her armpits. I hauled her to her feet and clipped her to my harness so that we were chest to chest, the old lover's clinch position, undignified but fast. Go, she barked. I launched, trying to make it gentle, and then poured on speed as I rushed toward the Atlantic. I was unbalanced, my regulator was unfamiliar, and the powder flow rate was absurd. I struggled to keep us on the level. We reached the ocean in three minutes. I turned and reversed course. You OK? I asked. Had worse, she replied. Mind me asking, ever land like this? Nope. Over the field, I descended briskly. I have bad hips, Gertrude warned. Bad ankles, bad knees. I cut our vertical speed and splayed my feet wide so that she, she touched down first. This had the unintended consequence of thrusting my pelvis right into her bosom. I brought my legs down, crumpling into a crouch to support her, and I had to grab her rump to keep us from toppling over. Some bright young thing gave us a wolf whistle. Quiet on the field, Gertrude bellowed. I unclipped, I unclipped her and retrieved her cane. She polished her glasses and set them back on her nose. Wonderful at my age that I should experience something new, she proclaimed. Are you married, Mr. Weeks? I blushed crimson. No, ma'am, I'm terribly sorry that I touched. Sorry, nothing. I've grabbed every last piece of wounded soldiers to get them up and down. 
No, Mr. Weeks, you misunderstand. Better for you if you were married. Go pick one of those pretty girls, make lots of babies, girl babies, if you please, and teach them to fly. Your daughters will be brilliant. Was I that bad, I asked. No, you dumbass, you're adequate. A woman who flew like that could get a test at Fort Putnam tomorrow, and she'd be at France by Christmas. If you were shorter, I'd suggest a wig and a set of bosom pads, but she'd never pass for a lady. So for you, a man, to join r &E, you're going to have to fly perfect. And that's a miserable existence. I wouldn't wish it on you. Go and settle down instead. I had a brief vision of Dar and me with a brood of daughters, all of them with dark wavy hair and perpetual frowns, scolding me on some point of politics and then flying rings around me. I rather liked it, but not just yet. I came to fly, I said. Gertrude nodded, as if it would have been impossible for me to answer differently. Then fly it again, unladen at best speed, and show me your hottest landing. I think I'll okay. stop it there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so as we've just heard, the novel is set during World War I, predominantly in Boston. Um, and one aspect of this book that I find particularly striking is how it manages to both feel very historically accurate, like this, this could have actually been the world in, during World War I, but it also feels really relevant today. There are a lot of issues um, and, and themes in the book that also feel like this book could happen now in the same way. Um, so as far as the historical context goes, how much historical research did you do? I think the best answer to that is some, or that would be my degree from the University of Wikipedia um, <laughs> on, on that sort of thing. So I, I've read some both on, both on the First World War uh, and a couple of books on the, on the suffrage movement, as well as sort of letters home from, from women who were in the Red Cross and other, hmm. uh, and other things from that era. So some research into the era itself. And then the important thing for me as well was sort of working out that alternative timeline. Because really, in, in this world, women have had the vote for about 50 years. So in some ways, that's sort of more similar to, you know, if you're, if you're doing it based on, based on actual history, uh, to more like the 1960s in some ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, women have had uh, effective, uh, widespread, cheap, and readily available birth control for about 50 years as well at this point, which maybe makes it something closer to, to 2015 uh, in some of the social mores. But in other ways, things have not advanced that much. So trying to, trying to figure out socially, politically, and, and economically, what's, sort of where, where are we in, in terms of that evolution? Those were, were important questions. So some of it is, Sad in a world very close to 1917, and other parts of it are, are much more much more contemporary. Yeah. So the the parts of it that feel really culturally re relevant today, those were done on on purpose. Somewhat, and I started I started writing it a long time ago. Uh, probably, if, if if we say it was seven years or so in the writing, it was back back about 2010 that I started a lot of it. Uh, you know, I didn't. I didn't write it particularly with the, you know, with the Me Too moment in mind, or, uh, or, or with the idea of of sort of regressive sexual politics and uh, uh, in the executive branch. Uh, but those things ended up ended up happening. So it was sort of a, a hmm. confluence of, of things. So it's a little bit on purpose, but not, <laughs> not quite. Okay. Um, one of the many ways in which this book feels very current and timely is this whole concept of being other or being different in the world that the protagonist is in. So as you said earlier, Robert is one of only a few men at an all-girls school studying a predominantly female discipline. This all feels very close to home for me. I'm a female software engineer, so sometimes I also feel uh, the same way that Robert must feel from time to time. Um, and philosophers in general are treated as outcasts and even with violence by some people. Um, and in the opening sentence of the book, Robert's daughter, this is in the future from where the part that Tom read, he asks, uh, his daughter asks him, why do so many people hate empirical philosophers? And this kind of question, it feels like something a kid would ask their parents today, just replace the word philosopher with any of sure. a bunch of other words. Um, was this, this particular theme of otherness purposeful? And did you write with any particular marginalized communities in mind? Um, I think I, what I wanted to do was write, write, again, specific to the world. So I didn't want to do a one-to-one do a -one 
sort of comparison with uh, immigrants or, or people of particular uh, ethnic background or, uh, or sexual orientation, but, but to think a little bit about, about incorporating widely from, from each of those. To me, the important thing as I was writing it, because I did not want this to be about a world that, you know, gosh, what would it be like if, you know, straight white males were the ones who were discriminated against? It's sort of a, it's a boring, a little bit of boring question to ask. Um, and the important thing that happened as I wrote it was more and more that insight into, so Robert's facing a lot of opposition to becoming an empirical philosopher. Danielle, who's his, his best friend and eventually his girlfriend, is interested in going the other way, and she's a war hero who wants to get into politics, uh, and the opposition she experiences, which is probably much closer to, to real world, world 1917, is, is much more intense. So did I have a single population in mind as I wrote it? No, but I hope that there's enough in, in common between sort of what's faced by any particular marginalized group, you know, be it, uh, be it a Midwest, you know, to, to some extent a Midwesterner at Harvard, somebody who is 10 years older than his, uh, uh, his medical school classmates, uh, you know, uh, or, or the first, uh, one of the first men at Radcliffe. Uh, some, some of that is, is a little bit the same, or, or some of those feelings are a little mm -hmm. bit the same, I hope, regardless. Great, so you mentioned Danielle, who's one of the many female characters in the book, and this is another aspect of this book that I just love. So because Robert is at an all-girls school and he was raised by his mom and his sisters, he is surrounded by strong, powerful women who are all uniquely capable. They're all intelligent and strong, but in vastly different ways. And I'm curious about where you got the inspiration for so many diverse female characters, and are any of them based on the women in your life? Um, I would say pretty much no autobiographically. Um, may, maybe taking a little bit, uh, taking a little bit composites of people I knew. Uh, anytime, particularly in the sequel, which is uh, much more military in its setting, when I wasn't sure what to do, I just asked what would, uh, what would one of the trauma surgeon, you know, one of the female trauma surgeons I've worked with say in this situation. It was often a, often a useful exercise. Um, but uh, let's see, Gertrude, who was on today, if she were if she were a man, I think would be quite a sort of boring, straightforward character. She's the Arlie Emery, or, or got the name slightly wrong. Uh, she's a drill instructor from Full Metal Jacket. She just happens to be a grandmother and limited in what profanity she's allowed to use. <laughs> um, likewise, uh, Emmeline, I think, if she were uh, if she were Robert's dad, would say, well, that you know, that's something like the great Santini. This is a retired military officer who's kind of strict and a disciplinarian and and this is, uh, this is the son who, who wants to follow in those same footsteps. Um, but in the simple inversion of gender, I don't know, something, something becomes different or, or slightly uncomfortable about it in a, in a productive way to me. Yeah, it's not, there are many fantasy novels in the world, but not many that feature as many uniquely interesting female characters as this one does. I appreciate that. Well, that's nice. <laughs> um, so about another character who I find particularly interesting, Dean Murchison. Yeah. Um, is he based on anyone you actually knew, a professor you had maybe? He is not. His, uh, uh, the special assistant dean is, is based on any number of, uh, any number of very efficient um, sort of assistants to uh, department chairs or, or things like that I've met over the years. Dean Murchison himself is one of the rare other, other male philosophers uh, and he's, uh, he's quite powerful in his own confused way. So he's a cartographer. He has sort of map-making magic, uh, and that is uh, driven to a large extent by a really exquisite sixth sense, a sense of position or distance between things that he has, and that is so overwhelming to him that that's sort of the only thing he's aware of at times. So somebody's like asking him a question from two feet away, but he's like, "Let's see. There is a stone under my foot that's two and a half feet away." And it's you know 600 million years old, and it's a piece of uh, uh, it's a you know a piece of slate. And like, hey, can you sign? Can you sign the form, please? <laughs> what? Uh, so that's 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 him. No, not based on any any, any one person. Okay. person. And I have a follow-up question about yes. Dean Murchison. So as you pointed out, sometimes he seems to have difficulty being pulled into the real world that he's actually living in, and some of what he says strikes 
true, gets right to the point, and other times he seems to be speaking in riddles. Should I, as a reader, spend time trying to make meaning out of those parts of his speech? So the, uh, he's, he's sort of the opposite of the usual Cassandra paradox, uh, which if I remember the, the story right, was a, a, a soothsayer prophet uh, in, in, in Greek mythology. She could see the future, but she was, was cursed when she got the, the gift of foresight that no one would believe what she said. Everybody knows that Murchison, uh, Murchison's predictions are pretty accurate. Uh, but he's sort of cursed with, with talking so obliquely that nobody, even, <laughs> even though they know what he's saying is important, or, or, or even if Robert is eventually able to get to that point. Uh, so yes, what he, what he says is important or accurate or, or with foreknowledge, uh, but I, I don't know I would spend too much time <laughs> trying, to, trying to puzzle it out. Okay. It'll become clear in the end. Okay, that's good to know. Um, so, uh, one of the parts of your history is that you studied at Harvard, and the novel takes place in Boston. And I'm wondering how much of what you wrote here was influenced by your own experiences there. So I, um, I started there at 19, in 1999. Uh, and so one of the interesting historical curiosities is I believe up until 1972, uh, our Harvard was, was all men. So they did not become co-ed until uh, probably about 27 years or so before I started there. There were still faculty who remembered that time and sort of remembered how badly a lot of the women at that time were treated. And sort of in a, in a countervailing way, there were certain, uh, certain of my classmates whose, uh, whose fathers or grandfathers had gone there. I didn't know anybody who'd gone there before I went there. But you know, within a generation or two, other, other, you know, my classmates uh, who sort of had this nostalgia for a time it was mm. when it was, was all, not that they'd ever been there at that time. Uh, but, but the sort of familial nostalgia for it in a way that I felt was, was, really, uh, was really strange. Like, you know, it's not 1979, it's 1999. <laughs> Why are we still, how can we possibly still be having that conversation? Hmm. Um, so a follow-up question about Harvard. Um, are the Cox and Hens, which is a secret society in this novel, based on a real <coughs> secret society at Harvard? And did you participate in one? Um, there were, no, I, was, I was not a secret society uh, okay. sort of guy. I was in an improv comedy group mm -hmm. who, uh, when, uh, when I, I sort of auditioned and was successful, they uh, came, to my, uh, came to my dorm room sort of dressed, dressed in dark coats and sunglasses <laughs> like they were the mafia or something. Uh, and then, uh, then we went out and had pizza. Uh, and it was a silly thing, but there is this split second where I'm like, what have I gotten myself? And it's a funny thing. <laughs> Uh, so a tiny bit based on that. Okay. Um, my my wife, who I who I also met while I was in college, uh, was in the Radcliffe Choral Society. Uh, with, it was Harvard and Radcliffe had merged by that point, but but some of the old names still remained. Uh, so they you know they they actually came in, in a very sweet way, like sang outside of the window and they gave you a flower and went out for pizza. So uh, some somewhere I guess on on the average between between those. Okay. <laughs> Um, is there anything else from your personal history that you drew from a lot when writing? So I would say my time in EMS in particular. I was an EMT basic in the, in, in the Pittsburgh area for about four years. So if you called 911 uh, after ef about 150 hours at the community college of Allegheny County, I was, I was the guy who pulled up in the ambulance. Particularly that idea of not knowing what you're, what you're going into or having a pretty good idea of what you're going into and then being completely wrong. And uh, so that, that informs sort of the opening uh, rescue sequence a little bit. Later on, uh, as Robert is trying to get into a burning building to save somebody, and things start sort of spiral, one thing goes wrong, and then things start spiraling out of control, I would say that is uh, not based on any one thing that I did, but sort of, uh, sort of under those high stress, stress situations as things begin uh, going, going wrong or as uh, as you try to fix a problem by creating an even bigger problem, uh, some of that some of that has filtered into it. Okay. Um, so there's a mantra in the book that gets repeated several times, which is "try less hard." Where did that come from, and do you find <coughs> do you find it useful in your own life as a writer or as a doctor? It's maybe something I aspire to, but I can't <laughs> I can't claim to put it into uh, put it into use as as much as I would like. Uh, that's, that's in part based on uh, my college roommate who was a rower, and it was a better rower than I was, but our dorm had you know, one of the eight-man 
cruise shells that, that we, we rode out, we had like intramural rowing, so we rowed against the other dorms. So he sat directly behind me. I was not a great rower. Uh, I was accused of trying to stroke the boat from, from the number six seat. You all have to move at exactly the same time. So if there's one person who has sort of independent ideas about how fast he'd like to be rowing that is out of sync with everybody else, that's a big problem. Uh, so, you know, he would be sitting behind me yelling, relax, relax, uh, <laughs> in, in sort of the same fashion. So I, 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 I sort of thought of him as I, as I wrote that line. Mm -hmm. But sort of that idea of, uh, of, of making things look easy or, or sort of the greatest competence being, being able to do sort of high pressure things in a relaxed way mm -hmm. certainly is applicable to what I do in medicine, though I'm a long way off most days from, uh, from getting there. So many of my fellow Googlers also pursue various artistic pursuits in their free time. What advice do you have for people whose full-time profession like yours is something other than writing but who wish to write a novel themselves? So if taking two years off from your main career is not an option, what I'd done for a long time was uh, sort of block out space every day to write. And that was the one piece of advice I'd probably gotten a dozen or a hundred times in my life, which if you want to get good at writing, you have to do it every day. If you want to finish a project, you have to do it every day. And it took me really a long time to, to take that to heart. I went to grad school for creative writing, and I certainly was not writing every day when I had, when I had the time or when that was my full-time job. Um, but as, as things got rolling in the book, I hit a point where it was sort of Self, like a self-sustaining reaction almost, where it got easier instead of harder, and where the habit of writing every day, even if it was just for 15 or 20 minutes before bed, um, uh, became, became easier to do than not to do. Um, and the, advice I've, the other advice I've heard is if you can write one page a day, by the end of, uh, by the, end of the year you'll have, uh, you'll have a novel's worth of pages. Whether it's any good or not, <laughs> whether you then spend seven years revising it, <laughs> Uh, is, is a different, different question. But write every day if you're trying to write a novel. Cool. So another thing that definitely strikes me as I read this particular novel is that it would translate very well as a movie. Uh, many of the scenes are very visual and you can picture exactly what's happening. So is that going to happen? I hope it happens. There has been, there's been a little bit of talk about it, mm. but uh, nothing, nothing concrete as okay. yet. And if it were to happen, do you have any particular actors in mind for any of the main roles? So none of the characters in the book are supposed to be very, maybe with the exception of, of, of Jake and Mayweather, none of them are supposed to be very good looking. So I imagine uh, Robert as sort of a young, young, less good looking Vin Diesel with hair. Oh, sure. Yeah, okay. I can picture that. <laughs> what about Danielle? I have not yet seen the right, uh, the right, the right yeah, person for, for her. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> who, do you, who do you see as Daniel? That's a good question. I'm also not sure. Hmm. I'll have to think about that and get back to you. Um, so that was the last question I had. I'm going to open it up now and see if anyone else has any questions they'd like to ask. And I'll, if you ask, I can repeat it so that... Oh, yeah. Um, I have two questions. Um, I think my first question is, so when I, uh, when I uh, read the synopsis of your book um, and decided to come to this, one of two of my favorite trilogies, like fantasy trilogies of all time, are um, His Dark Materials by Philip Pullman and um, the Enforcement Trilogy, which is like Sabriel, Lyriel, and the reason I bring that up is because both of those books are kind of set in these, like, it, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's a historical setting, but kind of things went in a different direction, and in the case of um, Sabriel and Lyriel, it's like, it's magic, but they don't call it magic, and they do different things, and I guess I was wondering if you had other books that you kind of drew inspiration from for, because it's such a creative, interesting. Yeah, I, I encountered both of those both of those series relatively late in my in my life. So Philip Pullman probably was when I was a junior or senior in college that I, I read those uh, for the first time. I've read Sabriel, which uh, has bell bell ringing yeah, magic really essentially, yeah. which is not like anything I've seen elsewhere. It was really striking to me. Uh, and it was an instance to me of, uh, of a male writer writing a teenage, uh, sort of late, late teens, uh, young woman character in a, pretty, in a pretty good way. I thought Garth Nix, to my, to my eye, or to my ear at least, did a nice job with it. Uh, the, two, the two books or two series, I would say, most directly influenced this one. One would be Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, which was a, 
a historical fantasy novel set in the Napoleonic Wars. It was written in about 2004, I think, by Susanna Clark. Much more high-minded, much more sort of literary in what it tried to do, particularly in terms of the prose style, where I was trying to write something a little bit plainer, both because it, uh, I thought it would be more accessible and ultimately because that was, that was the voice of that character, was a sort of plain-spoken, sort of simple-spoken Westerner. The other, the other series that came to mind to me a lot as I was trying to figure out how to write the book and structure the book was one that I had read sort of in my, probably in my mid-teens, which was the Farseer trilogy by Robin Hobb. Yeah. Uh, structurally used, uh, and I've seen it elsewhere, it's, it's in Ender's Game, it's in uh, uh, Starship Troopers, but the idea of somebody uh, looking back from, from middle age reflecting on, on more youthful adventures, so a little bit of that narrative distance, which was useful, and then starting each of the, each of the chapters with, uh, with, a, with an epigram or a piece, uh, a piece of that world to help, help with world building in a way that doesn't necessarily muck up the plot or, or slow things down, uh, and people can, can read it or puzzle over those things, or not, uh, as they choose. Um, and then my second question is sort of a follow-up to your first question about, um, you know, I've like played around with the idea of writing a book for a very long time, very, very, very long time, and I've written short stories, but I'm not consistent. Um, I guess like one question I have for you is when did you have a moment where you kind of just, you know, you're doing all this other stuff, you've clearly been to grad school a few times, so have I. Um, you know, did you ever just like wake up one day and just decide, you know, I, I need to like focus, I have a good idea, I need to focus on this and I really need to kind of start? It was my, it was my New Year's resolution for 2010 was I was going to write every day. I, I, I think I kept it with, I maybe missed two days or so over the, over the following six or seven years. <coughs> so yes, there was a day, and, and then once I decided I was going to do that, but it was like, I don't know, October or November of 09. I'm like, well, I might, might, as, I might as well start now. Part of that was the time pressure of saying, because I started medical school in 2010, like, you know, I'm working, I'm working a couple different jobs part-time right now. I have time, particularly as I, I sort of taper down on that and get set to start school again. So this is, this is the time to do it. And if I don't get a lot, of, a lot of pages down, if I don't get a rough draft together now, it's probably never gonna, never gonna happen. So I may as well try. And and was it always kind of this book particularly that you were writing, or were you kind of playing around with other ideas? I played around with many things over the yeah. years, but this is, this is one of the things I keep coming back to. And the first sketches I did toward it were probably as early as 2004. I was a travel writer at that time. Uh, I was down in New Zealand uh, doing a couple of the great walks, which are these multi-day hikes. I was doing it quite late in the year, so there were not a lot of other people out on the, out on the trails, and I kept getting lost. So that's sort of where, uh, where the map ma making magic came from. But I found it a really appealing world, an appealing idea. I kept coming back to it, would write a few pages, and then set it aside for months or years. One danger of that approach, I think, is that you can know too well what you want to do or be too unwilling to, to discard things. So ultimately, uh, in, in the revising, which took the longest time, it was, it was trying to streamline things and trying to drop a little bit of, of the things that I'd been doing just because, well, that's how I'd been doing it. But you know, does it make sense or is it useful to the story? Um, and that's something I had to figure out in revising rather than primary writing. All right. I think that brings us to a conclusion. Thank you so much, Tom, for visiting us and telling us all about the Philosopher's Flight. Well, Aaron, thanks for having me today, and thanks to our, our, our tech crew, too, who uh, were, were laboring quite a bit, but <laughs> went, went nice and smooth. Thanks. <laughs>